Hello, welcome back. Good to see you. This is Dev Savara. Today I'm going to run through five projects that are great in getting your skills up uh, in a personal level for software development and also analytical thinking and just generally being able to use computers and certain other concepts uh, around computers, including maths, physics, uh, and what else? Uh, I guess <laughs> geology, but we'll get to that later. All right, so the first one I think is a really easy and good introduction into coding, and that is a uh, user interface system. Now, what I mean by that is like you can build, uh, you know, you create a, an API, a system that allows you to create windows, um, allows you to create buttons, allows you to create uh, toggles, sliders, um, all things like that through the use of an in in input uh, control, right? So was pretty much one of the very, very first things that I kind of explored when I was coding after I did like basic data structures is like, well, let's let's make something cool like my own custom, you know, user interface. Back then in, I think it was 1998, 97, um, it was all kind of like text-based, so I used like custom ASCII symbols to build corners around windows and buttons, cool things like that. The user interface system was not really used for anything other than just experimenting, but it was fun. It was fun to, to put that together and to see it working. Uh, it allows you to really kind of get into, um, you know, understanding how a lot of the user interface systems work in the world. Um, there's heaps of them, and they all essentially have the same things. You have a button, you have a window, you have slider, you have toggle, you have maybe a component view where you might have a, what else, if I missed anything really obvious, uh, you know, have a table, a list, <laughs> things like that. So it's, um, it's a great way to get into building uh, structures. And then you can have a think about once you've got your user interface system, how data might feed into that. And it gives you a, a clarity around the difference between say the user interface view and the data that feeds into it. Really great fun. Uh, you can experiment with with any type of graphics uh, system. You can use a text based. You can use something that, that like a graphics based system, um, which kind of leads us into the next one: is to build either a two D or a three D uh, graphics rendering engine. Now you might say that a lot of this stuff uh, at a low level already is like a rendering engine. So let's have a look at some of the basic ones. Is Metal, which runs only on uh, Apple devices, and then you have a more generic one, which is uh, OpenGL. Now, OpenGL, I think Vulkan, Vulkan OpenGL, they run across, they run cross-platform. And what you can build with OpenGL is you have these primitives, for instance, like lines, triangles, things like that. You can use that to build the rendering engine for higher order primitives. And what I mean by that, you could have uh, a higher order primitives would be objects that exist like in 3D, like a, a mesh that you can import and it would render all of it. You can create lights and you can build an environment <clears throat> from say a data set. So you'd build like a data format, right? You'd have a data format that describes your world and then you'd take that data format and you would build a renderer for it. So this is the code that would render or draw this data set into uh, a 3D or 2D space. It's always, I mean, 2D is always going to be a little bit easier than 3D. Uh, what you can do in 2D is you can have basic objects like circles, squares, uh, and you can texture them too. So you could learn how to do texturing with OpenGL. So that kind of lets you understand how graphics works. And, and from that, you have your basic uh, components and building blocks that you can build a lot of other stuff from. So you can build a game with a 2D rendering engine. You can build simulation, 2D simulation, uh, you know. And that takes us to the next third item. It's really cool is a physics engine, 2D or 3D. Now physics engine, I actually have a, a games physics book that I want to refresh on because I, I, I enjoyed building and working with that physics spaces. You can take what you render and apply physics to the object. And all of a sudden you have this world that's kind of like alive. It's really cool when you start building these things and you see them come to life. So say for instance, you might have gravity. So you have these objects, they might have a mass and you have a gravity uh, equation that is applied to all the objects. Just see them change and and, and dropping. It's really cool. Uh, and you could uh, even you can play around with gravity values. You can play gravity between objects with their mass. Uh, you can also you know do sim simple stuff. Uh, so the other thing with physics is collision detection, collision detection, and the forces that you apply on objects when they collide. So say for instance, an object might have a rotational velocity, which is the way that it wrote, the speed at which it rotates. You take a, a you take another object that collide, they they bounce off each other and they kind of rotate away from each other too. 
You can do that in 2D or 3D. Uh, the maths is involved, but the print, the idea is, you, okay, you get the maths, you get your maths equations, you don't necessarily need to fully understand them. Uh, when I was working on my first graphics engine in 3D, I really had no idea how I could rotate, up, rotate objects, and I didn't know how quaternions worked. Um, I think, you know, even now it's kind of like fuzzy because I haven't used it in so long. But I, I did it. I built the quaternion model and I was able to rotate 3D objects properly around any axis. And I used that to kind of like just move on and, and build things around that. So a, a physics engine is a great way to understand how you can have things interact in a simulation and also a game. Simulate, like, you know, depends on what level of simulation you want. A lot of games development that I that I worked on had physics, but they were what they call fudged physics. <laughs> so what that means is that the physics was kind of tweaked and fudged, so you would have um, the game work better, like as a game than as a simulation. Uh, you know, if you have things which are really uh, very much a simulation, realistic simulation, you'll find that it's not that much fun, right? It's just too realistic and things just don't work uh, and interact as they would if you had a kind of like more speedy or faster response system. Uh, so I think that's one, two, three, four is, and I think uh, if you've got a graphics uh, rendering engine, then a really cool thing you can do is uh, build a terrain generator. Um, like a real, like a random terrain generator. Um, you can build that using various different algorithms to generate terrain from hills to to oceans and water and all those these kind of things. So if you have if you have your uh, rendering engine, you don't necessarily need a physics engine. You can use that to build that data set that is used to be rendered. And there are so many different types of uh, terrain generation. <laughs> it's just incredible. Uh, it's You can use like geological models, you can use time over time geological models, you can use just random noise to generate hills. It's a really cool way to play with different algorithms and it's a really cool way to learn some optimization techniques. So what happens is that if you build these terrains, especially large ones, um, you'll find that things can get slow because you have so much data. So you kind of like, you put you put yourself in this where you're forced to optimize the, the data sets. So we're, we've got, you know, all these things we could do. Um, you know, one of the, the last thing that I think, you know, I'd recommend uh, is to like, actually there's like, there are a few things. There's, I could make this list a lot longer, but I think a good one uh, to kind of get into um, to kind of take away just from coding at a high level is to you know get down into more hardware stuff. Is is to build a little robot. <laughs> yeah, a little robot. So what you do is you can get either you can. I mean, this is really cool for Raspberry Pi projects. You can get an idea of like how camera cameras work. Like you could get an idea of like how you would. Um, interact with a little robot sending data communications. Um, you know, you could use sockets, I think, um, you know, to connect with Wi-Fi on a, on a little robot to communicate with it. it. You learn so many skills about building like an interactive robot. Um, and if you wanted to, you could write, uh, you know, a controller, a controller system, like either a mouse or a pad or a third party device that takes an input and then controls your robot. I think building a little robot is a really broad, um, broad project, and it can mean many things. So, I think when you take that idea and say, "Like build a little robot," I think you should concentrate on, say, maybe a, a finite, like move a, a remotely controlled robot, right? That you use with a controller or with a mouse, or you build like a little robot. Um, how do you say? Like a, a friend that I knew built a little robot gun. So he got like a little. A little rotating thing, like a set, uh, a rotating uh, motor, and just a little input device that you can control the motor with. Uh, and he built a, like something that could fire a rocket, so like a signal to trigger the firing of the rocket and a little rotator. It's a little toy. But these little robots that you can build it allow you to uh, explore such a broad spectrum of skills around the uh, computer science space. So not only do you learn, learn the maths with these projects that I mentioned, but you also learn some of the low-level digital logic stuff. Uh, and even even building, like I'll add a bonus one, right? The bonus one, 5.1 or 6 or whatever. Bonus <laughs> is build a custom protocol. So say you have two machines, uh, building a custom TCP IP protocol um, 
Say, for instance, a great example is build a chat interface that sends messages from one computer to another. You have your sockets, you connect via sockets, and then you send commands and you can build a custom chat, right? That's it. You, just a custom chat between two computers is a great example. You can grow that. You can send. You can build a custom protocol that does a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's just uh, the endless list of custom protocols. It's, you know, it's just one for everything. Now, you, uh, there's also IoT device communication. So you have like a, maybe a custom protocol on an IoT device uh, via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, and then you send messages between the two to, so that they communicate. So when I say custom protocols, like you can invent a system of communication between two devices and then uh, write it out so those devices can communicate. Things like learning how to connect, disconnect, send commands, uh, you know, exchange text, exchange data, streaming, um, lots of different things with a custom protocol you can explore. Guys, thanks for listening to this list of uh, cool projects you can work on. And I hope you are inspired to actually create something cool. Um, all of these I have done pretty much either in industry or on my own. And sometimes I'd love to go back and just build one just from scratch for fun. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you in the next video. Bye.